Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Susan Lindner, your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. Today, we are going to sit back, relax, and we are gonna have a straight up glass, or if you prefer it on the rocks, a conversation about Jack Daniels and innovation and innovating one of the most well-known, respected, and beloved brands here in the United States and around the world. And I'm just absolutely tickled that Heather Howell, who is the Global Director of Trademark and Innovation at Jack Daniels Innovation, is joining me today. Um, if you don't know, or if, you're, if you haven't yet had the pleasure of enjoying Jack Daniels, it is the most valuable spirits brand in the world by Interbrand's Best Global Brands 2022 report. Not to mention, and I'll let Heather share the good news with you about how great Jack Daniels is on a global scale. The brand has remained relevant for 155 years, and Heather's collaborative leadership is a key to the success of their most recent super premium whiskey innovations. And I'm just so excited. Um, to have this conversation with Heather today. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Heather. Thank you so much, Susan, and all the, the listeners that are out there. It's I'm absolutely humbled and honored that you reached out. And uh, I definitely would be drinking my Jack Daniels um, on the rocks with everybody. So hopefully uh, everybody can kind of enjoy a, a Jack Daniels with us as we we talk about uh, such an important American iconic whiskey. Well, and I can't think of a better way to enjoy the show. So especially during this holiday season. So um, so let's get started. Let's talk about you, Heather. So how did you come to Jack Daniels? How did how did you even begin this role in innovation? So you're talking, you know, our, our listeners here are innovators from around the world. And so how did you get your start in this in this role? It's such an interesting story. I don't have the typical um, ladder up career at all. I've zigged and zagged. And um, so I think it's a, it's a really interesting, people ask me this question quite a bit and there's not a short answer, but I'll, I'll give you the cliff notes version. I actually uh, was in healthcare and in recruiting and in HR. And the reason I say that that was so helpful is that people do build brands. So if you can motivate people, find out where, they have strengths for your week and really kind of rally the troops, if you will. Um, that in and of itself is one of the most important things that I have found with innovation is that it is true that people do build brands. And I would say that we have some of the best people here at Brown Foreman and particularly um, working on this amazing iconic whiskey. My career is really interesting, um, came from HR, realized that I wanted to change the world and was the second person hired into an organic rooibos tea company called Ruby Red Tea. And I worked there for six years. I had never raised a dime. I didn't quite know a whole lot about the ready to drink industry. I just knew that Whole Foods was popping up and folks were really trying to kind of understand a little bit more about their caloric intake. Um, here in the state of Kentucky, we're known for whiskey, bourbon, and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Louisville Slugger and not necessarily health and wellness. So <laughs> I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of get in there and see what I could do. And so I was the chief tea officer there for six years and grew it out of the back of my minivan into 50 different states. And it caught the attention of Brown Foreman and Brown Foreman uh, was, you know, I, I don't know what it was or who it was, but I can tell you now that the current CEO is the one who um, made my offer. And I thought this is somebody that I want to come to work for. And these are the brands that I'd like to kind of represent and to be a female in a whiskey world and to do what I do. They totally embrace what I bring to the table. So I'm extremely fortunate but a very interesting career path from tea to whiskey. Whiskey is a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from teetotaler <laughs> to drinker. I love it. Um, so, you know, so that transition and then, you know, one marketing is one thing, but innovating is something different, right? So if you're, 
as you're moving into this role, did you have a vision for where you wanted to take the brand and, and the possibilities that you thought the Jack Daniels brand had? It's interesting because I didn't really talk about my career so much here at Brown Foreman. I've been here for eight years mm -hmm. and I really started off on um, as the director of global innovation, but looking at some of the smaller, more emerging brands and then developing um, brands like Cooper's Craft. We developed our first ever slain Irish whiskey. We acquired some of the single malts. And so I was in emerging brands. And the reason I'm even saying this to the listeners is because I enjoyed those kind of small um, entrepreneurial brands because it's the world in which I came from, right? I mean, I had a tea company that nobody knew about and then all of a sudden it just blew up. So yeah, I think um, that's some, something that I really loved. And I, I recall um, one day uh, getting ready to leave and somebody said, hey, the, the director of innovation for Jack Daniels, it, it's open and you should go for it. And to me, I thought in the back of my mind, Jack is such an iconic brand and you know, it, it's made it. Um, how could I possibly add value to it? And as I started to kind of interview for it, I realized that all of the things that I thought, like small brands, cult-like following, um, Jack is the definition of craft. I mean, if you go to Jack Daniels and you see it, this brand has survived prohibition. I mean, th this is truly the definition of it. I mean, the world kind of in my opinion, when you go there, it just sets the world straight. You know, it's um, everything's kind of slow to go, just like they make their whiskey. I mean, there's a saying all over the place. Every day we make it, we make it the best we can. And, uh, you know, it's just it, it's a brand that's easy to fall in love with because there is so much care and attention to detail. And right away, I thought, what can I do to turn the dial up and work together as a team in order to build the bridge from Louisville into Lynchburg. Our corporate headquarters is in Louisville. Lynchburg is where our makers are. So um, we have to bridge the markers, the marketers and the makers. And I think that's really where the magic happens. Hmm. So you come into this 155 year old brand and tell us a little bit about well, maybe you can give us a little bit of background on Brown Foreman too, for my listeners who aren't familiar with the brand behind the brand. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that portfolio. So Brown Foreman is an amazing organization. It's based out of Louisville, Kentucky. It's still um, family owned. So the family still is on pretty much every floor here. They're the most humble group of people that you could ever, you would never know, even if one was sitting next to you, that they were actually family. They work just as hard as anybody else. And they kind of create this essence or this culture um, of just humility and pride, I think are the, probably some of the best ways I could describe it. We have some of the most beautiful and recognizable super premium brands in the world. Um, I know our CEO was just at the New York Stock Exchange um, for our 150th year plus of, um, of owning and operating and running some of the most beautiful liquids through this organization, Woodford Reserve. Um, I'll just name a couple of the, the brands behind the brand. Yeah. Um, board. Um, we've got Old Forester, which is the founding brand. Um, we've got Jack Daniels, Slane. We just acquired Gin Mare, um, which is a beautiful gin. And we've also just very recently um, announced that Diplomatico will join our, uh, which is a rum, a beautiful, very high-end, super premium rum, um, will also join our portfolio. So we've got Ford's Gin. We've got just uh, an amazing array of brands that are sprinkled throughout the Brown Foreman portfolio. And we are just experts at making whiskey. And, and I would say our crown jewel is Jack Daniels. And uh, we take a lot of pride in it. Yeah. So Tell us a little bit about how innovation works now at Jack. So are you um, local? Are you global? How does the innovation process work when you think about bringing a new idea forward? That's such a good question because um, the one thing I will say is that Jack Daniels being, you know, one of the most valued spirit brands, the most valued spirit brand in the world is the fact that we are in a hundred over 170 countries all over the world. So when we sit down to innovate, the world sits down to innovate. Um, we've got key stakeholders. Um, something that I did early on, there were six of us that started something called the Innovation Council. 
And it's that, you know, our master distiller, our assistant master distiller, uh, product manager uh, who kind of knows a little bit about everything to be dangerous, what lines, um, you know, how we can keep our cogs down and how we can deliver beautiful packages all over the world. And of course, many of you listeners, I'm sure are dealing with inflationary issues and all the other things with supply chain that the rest of us are. So SAT with six, there's now over 25 members of the Innovation Council, and it's basically key stakeholders across research and development, quality control, sensory, brand marketers of US, Canada, um, global uh, marketers and regional leaders. And then we have guest speakers. We meet every two months. And one of my biggest things is that there's never the same slide twice. Um, it just shows consistent progress. And we also use our insights. I mean, we have this big thing where it's about surprising and delighting our consumers all over the world. So I think to your question, um, when we sit down, we don't just think about Yes, this brand out of Lynchburg, Tennessee, and every single drop coming from this small town, um, this Cave Spring water, but we also think about how do we surprise and delight our consumers on any occasion and exceed expectations, whether it's in global travel retail, whether they come to our home place and get our distillery series. Um, we just make sure that um, everything that we do, everything that we do, even how we treat our people, um, that we listen and that we deliver and that we over deliver. Hmm. And so that process of bringing together 25 people. So can you walk us through maybe an idea, you know, that's come up over the last three or four years, because, you know, you had mentioned to me that it takes four years for an idea, right? Even if it's approved, signed off, et cetera, it's still got to sit in these barrels for the next four years, right? So um, what is the process like when you gather these 25 folks around? And not an easy number to get consensus around necessarily either. No, and I think the tensions, we call it the push and the pull. Um, that's, what, that's what I think is the beauty of it. And then also having leadership that trusts you enough to kind of back away. I think an innovation mindset is so different than any other mindset. Susan, one of the things I've learned a long time ago, I think in my career, and I, I, maybe it's age, I don't know, but I just don't have an ego. I think with innovation, you just really, it's a team sport. And it's so important that these 25 members are heard because at the end of the day, you can have a gorgeous bottle, but if it's not lucrative to the business and it doesn't deliver back to the bottom line, okay, great, you've got a gorgeous bottle. But at the end of the day, is it really kind of giving your you know, your shareholders, the value that they're seeking, as well as, you know, I think all of us here are shareholders. So we, we talk a lot about this execution of brand um, business and, and consumer and getting consensus is never easy. One of the, um, one of the first things that I did was, was just kind of go through the barrels that we currently had. And you can imagine a brand like Jack Daniels, there's quite a few barrels, um, <laughs> of which we make. To say the least. Yes, exactly. So there was a project um, that had started in 2015. So for all those that went way before me, that was actually the year I started here. They had this genius idea of holding back a couple of barrels and aging them. And when I looked at the age of them, I thought, these are, these are going to be 10 years old. They're going to, I mean, this is pretty cool. What, what do we have here? And Jack Daniels, over about a hundred years ago, put age statements on his package. And so we went back into the archives. We actually had to reach out to people who had the original packages and the bottles. And then what we did was we put those labels together and we developed the exact same cartouche. I actually have it here. I don't know if you can see it. This is what we call the cartouche right here. But we had to piece it all together and we had an artist come in and redraw this cartouche, which was the original that Jack Daniels actually put age statements in. Mm. We launched this over this past year. And I remember our, our public, public relations gentleman spend, he goes, an age statement on Jack Daniels? Like, do you realize how big that is? Like that's, you know, we age our whiskey until it's ready. I mean, we don't really put age statements on it. And I remember at that point thinking to myself, 
we've been aging whiskey longer than any of our competitors. So we are definitely the ones who should go ahead and bring this back out and do what Jack did over a hundred years ago. So the beautiful thing about Jack Daniels is that we've got a safe. It has all these old bottles. We have all these archivists. We have, and, and you get to pull the past into the future. If anyone knows how to mature and age whiskey, it's our master distillers and it's mm-hmm. Jack Daniels. So when we released this, Susan, we didn't know. I mean, we, we all just sit there, you know, and we're like, oh God, let's hope that the consumers love it as much as we do. And uh, I said Sven's name, but he just celebrated 15 years with the company. And he looked at me and he said, I thought this was big. This is huge. We got 1.19 billion impressions from this. Oh my group. gosh. <laughs> yeah. So when you, when, when you do unleash something with Jack Daniels and it has that historical context, there's just so much pride that pops off on this floor and, and everybody had a hand to play from the master distillers to the folks who make our whiskey every single day to the folks who designed every, I mean, our design team here is just incredible um, to, you know, all the people that know the stories of stories past that we work with and they help us write all of our copy. I mean, it's just such a historic brand and there's so much pride that um, you just, the explosion of excitement from everybody all over the world when we launch something is, it's, it's really surreal. Hmm. So for, for many people, right, that is a, um, it's a fundamental shift, right, in how you're thinking about kind of taking the Jack Daniels brand and moving into these super premium categories. Can you talk about that as a business decision and as a as a market decision for what you thought your customers were looking for? So Jack to me has always really been super premium. I mean, it's a brand that it's so cutting edge. I mean, when you look at it, when you see people wearing the shirt, it just, it it says something without saying anything at all. Mm. And one of the things that we really looked at was how can we continue? We are the most complete and one of the most complete distilleries in the world. We do everything from bark to barrel to bottle. And how do we continue to push the envelope? How do we continue to take what we currently have and show the world truly our leadership position? So Coy Hill was a single barrel special release and it was the highest proof Release, but you would have never known it because it's just so smooth. And how we are able to extract that and how we are able to do that is just spectacular when you think about the level of knowledge and whiskey knowledge in Lynchburg on our teams. Mm. The other thing that we saw was it's fine to follow. I mean, you know, you can kind of look at something, you know, I always think about innovation from the standpoint of like Tylenol and then aspirin or Kleenex and then puffs or, you know, whatever it is. But what we decided was that we were definitely going to take a leadership position and we were going to really kind of push one another. And that's the part of this innovation council I love is that we always say yes and like, how can we take something and bend the rules just a little bit in ways in which it enriches the whiskey? So one of those perfect examples would be our just newly released, not only the age series, but also the bonded series. We make every drop of whiskey in Lynchburg. So we thought, you know what? Let's go back to our roots of, you know, 1895. And let's let's really kind of dig in there. And so we created a series that just won the coveted Whiskey Advocate number one whiskey in the world. Wow. And now it's through, um, this one here. And it's it's basically Jack Daniels bonded. And we also have our triple mash here as well. That is the first time in history that three straight whiskeys have been blended together and they're all bottled and bond. On the back though, this is the part that I love was the original Jack Daniels bottle um, in history. So again, we have pulled our history into the back and then basically blown in his original bottle. So when you, when you hold this up, you're not just holding up the fact that every day we make it, we make it the best we can, but you're also holding up the true Jack Daniels authentic package in your hand. And so 
to me, it's, it's so much about blending the art, the science and the history and really authenticating and premiumizing a beautiful brand that deserves it. Yeah. So, um, and this makes people feel how, you know, so much about innovation is creating a new emotion for people. And, and so what kind of feedback were you getting when you're like, this is the 1895 bottle, you know, from, from back in the day, right? This is what cops would have been looking for when they were busting up saloons and things like that. How do, what kind of response did you get? I think that's the beautiful thing. I, I, I kind of started off with like innovators. They have a different mindset and they're able to kind of, I, I call them kind of the connectors, right? So connecting commercial, like what would pop for them? What are some of the things? And so as we sit around the table, we have our head of creative design um, and you know, it's just so cool to sit there. And when Chris Fletcher, who's our master distiller or Lexi Phillips get up and the fact that we're all sitting together around the table, I mean, these are whiskey makers, right? They've got their science hats on and, you know, they're, they're just amazing whiskey makers, but to hear them talk about the bottles, the packaging, the design, to me, it, it, it it's everybody. Like I said, it's a team sport. And so, mm. you know, having that opportunity to sit across the table with one another, whenever somebody kind of holds it up or takes it back to 1895 and that original kind of emotive feeling, I think that's where you really kind of, to me, other brands can't do that. You know, there's this level of authenticity. And the fact of the matter is we've been 150 years around the block, 155 years, and we just keep pushing ourselves to be better. And I think that's the beauty of an innovator is connecting all of those different dots. I remember getting off of our elevator here on like a couple of weeks I was in on this brand and I saw the original bottle and there's a lock and key. And I had asked to get the lock and key to hold that bottle. And just the way it felt in my hands, I was like, I want to bring this bottle back. I want to do, I, I somehow want to bring this forward. So we actually brought all of our advocacy folks um, that actually run and work with our bartenders in the on trade. And it was them who said, blow it in the back. And therefore bartenders, when they hold on to it, it will help with grip as well. And you'll have that beautiful package. Make sure that the neck is a little bit elongated as they pull it out and they start to mix cups. So every, everything we do, we don't do it in a vacuum. We go to the experts or we go to the folks that are actually in the field every day and we grab them and say, you know, can you be a part of history? Can you, can you help us make this the best it can be? And again, I think with innovation, it's, it's literally being able to kind of leave your ego at the door and realize you're not, you're not good at everything. Um, there are others that are even better than you are. So continue to kind of pull from them, extract, and then create and uh, hope that you meet and exceed those expectations. Yeah. You know, it's funny because um, this is the innovation storyteller show. And um, I'm sure I have a lot of listeners who are going, well, I don't have a 155 year old brand. And, you know, and um, I love hearing stories around innovation where people do have the opportunity to dig into the archives. We had folks on from Corn and Glass who talked about finding the recipe for the Moderna vial um, for the vaccine for COVID you know, it was actually a glass that was developed in the thirties for super cold, super, you know, super long-term at temperature, um, glass. And so, you know, they have an opportunity to look backwards and say, you know, what was then considered a failure, not necessary, et cetera, and could resurrect that in, in a whole new era for the rest of us. And, um, but, you know, talking with folks at Spotify or Tesla, you know, like those archives <laughs> don't yet exist, right? And so reinventing a brand or, you know, Gucci is talking about, you know, resurrecting floral patterns that nobody had seen in the last 50, 60 years. So um, what, what kind of insights do you have, Heather, for those who don't have that incredible history to leverage? What do you think about, you know, when you're saying, okay, let's not look backwards now, let's look forwards only. Um, which may be an impossible task for a brand like Jack Daniels that's so wedded to the story of its history. But tell us about some of the look forward stuff and how you make decisions, because you've certainly introduced a host of flavors that, you know, 
might've been shocking to some people who were purists when it came to Jack. You know, I think that came before me. And I would say that there are people who, and I, I mean, I think, I think we can all go back to the first time we ever tried whiskey, right. Whether it was our grandfather's or, you know, my 21st uh, birthday, 21st birthday, <laughs> Kentucky Derby for me. Um, and it wasn't Jack Daniels, but I, I don't know that I would say that I love it or have as much appreciation for it as I do today. And so one of the things that we consistently ask ourselves is, you know, how do we invite people in? How do we recruit and re-recruit? So, I mean, the introduction of honey, the introduction of apple, the introduction of fire to me is us. The really, cinnamon, cinnamon related flavor. Yes. Yes. Oh. So the fire is, is, I mean, it's, it's great with eggnog for the holidays. Ooh. It gets um, uh-huh. So I, I will say that it, it, the, the whole thing, I mean, I often think, you know, honey, something everyone can relate to fires a little edgy. Right. And then you of course got Apple, which globally, because we're in 170 countries, is Apple is something that everybody can kind of come to grips with, right? So when you think about our portfolio overall, some products work better in other parts of the world. And so we've got to find something that's a common language, which is also something that I think a lot of other brands don't have. There is one product, though, that we just released in can. And I think this could be relatable to folks who don't have that 150. We have never done this before. Um, It's not like I could look back on it and go, well, how should we do this? How should we talk about it? What should we do? Um, We are actually launching for the first time ever in a very, you know, small but burgeoning category. Jack, when Jack Daniels enters a category, um, all of a sudden it can create a category. So we are launching in global travel retail. Next year, um, you'll see our American single malt. It is the first time we have ever done this. Um, When we started on the project, we consistently, like I said, push. We nicknamed it Maltergeist um, because we could not get it under control in the stills. And so- Wait, wait, say that again. What was the problem on the manufacturing end? It was just basically when we went to go distill it, you know, the heat and all of that. And just, we are so used to doing the same mash bill for 150 some years. Right. And so when you do this and the mash is the corn part of the equation, right? Exactly. right that actually ferments and becomes right. The right. And become whiskey. the whiskey. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, with Jack, it's always pretty much been our, our mash bill, right? Well, when you start playing with rye and then you start playing with malt and all these different mash bills, all of a sudden you you create and innovate in a way that has never been done before. And so the way in which we were doing the malt, it was creating it look like a foam party. And (laughs) and so they were like, oh, foam, whiskey foam everywhere. Whiskey foam everywhere. Sounds like and (laughs) you know, I think the whole thing. Um, Susan in and of itself, like for the folks that we, we had to go back in our history, we found out that Jack, um, actually had a great, great grandmother who was from Scotland. So we put all these stories together and then we developed concepts and we went out to consumers who love Jack and consumers who had left Jack. And we really put true stories together. And we found out that folks were like, oh, you're pushing it too hard with Jack Daniels. I don't believe it. It's not true. And all of these things were true. They were, they were, they were all true. But what we learned was that we would honor our scotch and the historical roots of blending and that type of thing. But yet everyone just said, just be distinctively Jack, Mm. be true to your roots, be true to who you are. And so it was really cool that they were like, ask what Jack can do for single malts and scotch um, versus the other way around. So it was really great. And so it was so cool to be in Cannes and meet with all of these different retailers all over the world that descend at the TFWA. And and you mentioned Gucci, you mentioned, you know, these brands, they're all there. Um, Sorry, the TFWA for my listeners? Yeah, yeah. It's basically for travel retailer, travel retail, global travel retail. So Which is duty-free for most of us, right? It's what you buy in an airport. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and normally what we try to do is launch something very exciting and exclusive only to that channel. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. 
And so this was this was just this past year we we introduced it and I think the biggest thing you can do is be open. I mean, at this point, I just had one bottle that we had to kind of put together there. Um, we brought the liquid and we just asked them the five P's of marketing, you know, the price, the promotion, the product, like, what do you all think? Um, and then we pivoted and, you know, coming soon in 2024 for the first time ever, um, I'll be biting on my nails and nervous and <laughs> hopefully people will love it as much as they said they did. Um, maybe they didn't want to hurt our feelings. I don't know, but um, I would say that you can, even if you don't have the history, most people just want you to be true to your brand. And uh, I think that that's what's most important. You know, you know what makes that brand tick. I, I came out of a tea company, started from nothing and, and built that. And it was really about, you, you have to know what are the things that people want to hear. And then we have dark markets where you can't advertise. So your bottle has to literally every corner of that bottle has to speak to that consumer. Mm. But, um, mm -hmm. that, that's the, that's the key piece of advice that I can give to folks that are entrepreneurial, build your history. Yeah. And so that storytelling is so important, right? That you could dig back, 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 back and find that Scottish ancestor that makes a connection to the single malt world um, is really important. And, and certainly I think all of us has probably watched spirits and the, and the whole alcohol, um, the whole beverage sector really transform over the last 20 years. Um, I'm in my fifties and I think about what options were available to us in college. You know, when we began drinking, I think Sam Adams was the most craft beer. I went to school in Pennsylvania, maybe Yingling, one of the original beers of America, were available to us, but otherwise they were huge commercial brands, you know, from Anheuser-Busch, et cetera. And then we've seen this tipping point, right? And tons of government incentives for lots of craft breweries, distilleries, et cetera. Um, and a push for the ultra authentic, right? We're going to go and find the peatiest, the maltiest, the whatever, like really like, frankly, tough to digest, tough to smell. Like I've been to Scotland. That's, that's stuff for me as a gin drinker, that's tough stuff. But, um, but there has been a, a wave that's swept across America that's also very curious, right? And so do you find that um, global consumers are in an experimentation phase where we're willing to try beverages in cans, right? I, I know in the UK and Europe, we've seen you know gin and tonics in cans for a really long time already. You know They understood the joy of a refreshing commute <laughs> on the way home that in America we have not, we would stop at the bar and then get on the train, right? So <laughs> tell us a little bit about the innovations you've seen across the board as the industry. And then where does Jack see itself in the midst of those changes? It's, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, when I go and I travel, I'm so interested. I'm like, never the person that you want to go with in the liquor store, because I'm just like, <laughs> hey, do you mind if I take a couple photographs or pictures? You know, I don't, I don't want them to think I'm going to like be shoving things in my purse or what's this woman doing? I am always so enamored by the evolution of just the whiskey and the, the whole bourbon and the aficionados. And like last night, I'm trying to listen into the top 100 from Fred Minnick, who's like this bourbon connoisseur. And he's just this amazing man that just, I mean, right here in Kentucky and screams the whole brown spirits. Um, song every single day and has written several books. So it, the explosion of people coming into this, I, I think that Napa is one, right? And then you've got just this whole bourbon trail that has just absolutely exploded. When I look at things What's like- What's the bourbon trail? I don't know what that is. Oh yeah. It's essentially uh, starts um, here in Kentucky, the urban bourbon trail, and it's like Woodford Reserve, Old Forester, and then other, you know, kind of brother and sister companies too, that, you know, all boats rise, but it's like angels envy. And there are so many mictors um, all right here. So it's kind of like we've built out this Napa Valley of whiskey, if you will. And ah. these stores are spectacular. And then of course you go a little further South and you'll hit Jack Daniels. And then they've got the Tennessee whiskey trail too. So there's just some really great um, nearest green. There's just so many great distilleries that are all kind of collapsed in these. And it, you could spend a couple of days kind of going through and enjoying kind of the experimentation of whiskey and the explosion of it throughout. 
the one thing, I mean, you mentioned the cans and the ready to drinks. Um, we just recently, um, I, I'm sure that everybody has in some way or another, if you've been on LinkedIn or one of those channels, you've seen that the two largest American icons have come together in a can. That's huge news for us. And Jack Daniels and Coca-Cola have signed on. And so, you know, one of the things we're consistently doing with innovation is the business side of it. You know, how do we expand our ready to drinks? It's a totally different industry, um, you know, than what we're used to with glass bottles and super premiumization and liquor stores. And so that kind of uh, marriage between those two American iconic brands, we call it brand in a hand, brand in a can. Um, <laughs> It's the largest bar call in the world, Jack and Coke. Um, a bar call is an order, right? From your, to your yeah. bartender. <laughs> I'm learning the lingo here, Heather. <laughs> That's okay. It took me eight years. I'm still learning. I'm still <laughs> learning every single day. Um, but those are the types of things that we're constantly thinking about is how can we serve up things to consumers in a world that's just busy, right? What we do is we've got this next generation of consumer that holds one of these in their hands. And then we hope that they hold one of these in their hands. And that's just one of the things that we're consistently battling is, you know, we've also got a three tier system. You've got Amazon, but you know, we have to go through a liquor store. It's just the way that we do everything is calculated and strategic. And really it's all with the consumer in mind at the end of the day. Um, mm. I think any major brand it's kind of got to start with an idea that if the consumer doesn't care and the consumer doesn't buy in, we do a lot of insights. We learn a lot about what the consumers are looking for. And then we develop a lot of different concepts and things like that, test them internally, externally. And, and then, you know, eventually you've got to make decisions and go. So what is the hardest part about getting an idea through a new idea? Like what's, is there a gauntlet that you feel like you have to run? You know, you have your council of 25. What's the hardest part about getting the yes internally? I think the hardest part is the, is building the plane while you're flying it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the hardest part is innovation is evolving every single day. I mean, we've got new technology, we've got apps coming out every other day. We've got another brand that's launched that we consistently look at. Why can't we be them? Why can't we be this? And I think ultimately at some point you, you talked about that gauntlet. I think at some point you've just got to go, Hey, I think we've, we've got the majority of it. We need to push forward and we need to move because supply chain, inflation. We had COVID when I was in this role. So you can imagine, um, we didn't know at that point, is Lynchburg going to stay open? Is it not like, how are we going to continue on? And so I think the biggest thing is, is, is pivoting, but then also realizing like we've got customers, we've got consumers, and we saw one of our best years ever, right? With, with COVID, um, people becoming much more in tune with whiskey and what they wanted and brands in which they, I think, I think you said it, one of the most beloved whiskey brands, it was like, we, we've got to make sure that we satisfy our consumers, even through a time when people are scared. Um, and so I think, you know, having seen all of that, I really truly believe the reason that Jack Daniels continues to be so successful is because of the people and the fact that we want to consistently push the envelope and you know, gauntlets, I love that because I, I think every single day, if you're trying to be the best and you are the best, you're your own worst enemy. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I, I obsess over the colors. I obsess over one adjective, you know, or, you know, how is this going to land in the eyes and the ears of the beholder, which is ultimately, you know, the drinker. and the beauty of it is we all kind of hold hands together and, and jump in. And I think that that's what makes the gauntlet so much more, I guess it, it makes it easier because we're all in it together, you know, versus just one person making decisions and pulling all of the levers. Um, that's what you've seen and, and you can see it in all of the innovation. I mean, Jack Daniels hadn't innovated 
a super premium product at this level in 25 years. Wow. So the series, I mean, that, that is, that is how much thinking that is how much time, how much energy, how much, you know, that we've got when it sits in a barrel like that. So it's almost like I've got to look through a looking glass 10 years out. And, um, that's where the nervousness comes in, right? Because you can't just go back and redo, you know, we're not a widget company. We're a whiskey company. That's right. So, yeah. The gauntlet is every day until it launches. <laughs> yeah. So you don't feel like a push pull necessarily on, I have three competing innovations that I really want to push forward to. And, and, you know, I know this is really going to work well in Asia, but I really got to do stuff for my people in Latin America. And, you know, thinking about those considerations about even which goes first, you know, in terms of considering what's coming next for Jack. It's, it's, it's true. I mean, I, I do feel like there's times where I sit kind of in the middle of like a DNA, you know, where there's, there's all these different spoke hubs and spokes. I call it kind of the, the hub and spoke model. And one of the biggest challenges is that Jack is such a big brand, right? But over 150 years, 55 years, we've, we've learned how to perfect it. We've learned how to continue on with the same traditional whiskey making values and, and ways in which we make it. It is hard when you come out something like 10 year old and you don't know what the reaction is going to be until people react, right? And so you want to give everybody the 10 year old, but you've only got 3,000 precious bottles of 10 year old in which, you know, people were stealing from back bars. They were getting arrested. Like we've had hand, you know, cuffs. <laughs> I mean, just wow. There's so, there's so many stories when something like this does come out because the secondary market, it could go for thousands of dollars, right? Like on eBay, people are reselling 10 year old Jack. If if you look on the secondary market, um, I'm just looking here at like all these different whiskeys that I have up here, Coy Hill, our single barrel special releases, Heritage Barrel is one of those. I mean, any of our squires or listeners that love Jack will know all of these. The hardest part is, you can't always serve the world in a scarcity model. Mm. So it is a lot of times, I think some people feeling like, oh, I didn't get this and I didn't get that. But many times what we're, what we do, I'm going to, I'm going to pull one up here. So we had Tennessee tasters. We reimagined this to be our Jack Daniels distillery series. Essentially what this is, is it's our innovative playground. We essentially create new innovative whiskeys, anywhere from a thousand to 800 to 500 cases. We work directly with our master distiller and essentially we release two, maybe three of these a year. We see how consumers coming to our distillery receive these really innovative whiskeys. And then what we do is we test and learn with these right out of our lab and into the state of Tennessee. We can't just sell them directly into our home place. But this is kind of our, this is a lab sample style bottle. And uh, we, we start small, throw the rock in the water in our home place in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And then as it ripples out, we kind of, you might see these come out in bigger, um, fewer, bigger, bolder ways. So I would have to go to Jack Daniels and, and be on a tour, let's say, or go for a tasting and be able to try them. And, and why are these two so unique, for example, what makes them different? So the unique thing about these is that this one is Barrel Reunion 2. This one we just released. It's straight Tennessee rye whiskeys finished in high toast maple barrels. So we test everything from wood, from staves, to storing our our Tennessee whiskey in unique barrels that have already been treated with wine or other products. Or maple syrup. Or maple syrup. (laughs) Uh-huh. Or, money or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, all these innovative ideas that come our way and we test and learn and we see what the reactions are. We do that as well with our Jack Daniels single barrel special release. And I'm really big on, instead of just going, you know, bolder and bigger, it's like, start fewer, see what the reactions are, then grow bigger and then get better and bolder. And so that's kind of one of our, our mantras is, not everything is going to be right out of the gate for everybody, but some things we definitely feel like the world deserves this. The world deserves more Jack. And so 
that's where we have the bonded series, which had been 25 years since we had released a super premium set of expressions at that level. A set of expressions. Fantastic. I don't think I've ever really thought about my liquor in the way that you are describing it, Heather, but I'm learning a lot and I'm grateful. Okay. So I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a moment and I'm going to ask you questions that I ask all of my guests on the show. So here's my first, if you had the opportunity, well, first off, let me ask you this greatest innovation of all time. What would you say since the start of human history? What's your, what's your choice? The iPhone. Yes. Yes. Because, because we're addicted to it. Just like Jack. Is that why? I think that's exactly why, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that I can't live without. And it's a little bit like my whiskey. So that's definitely, there you, you go. Know, okay. it, 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 it's ever changing. So yeah. Um, if you had the choice to chance to join any innovation team in human history, which one would it be? If you could join a team and be part of something, wow, breakthrough. Hmm. Wow. Breakthrough. Mm -hmm or not, maybe just small and incremental. <laughs> you know, I think that um, I, anyone who knows me well, they know that I absolutely love luxury. I think you mentioned Gucci. I think you mentioned um, just that higher end, that super premium fashion, fast fashion. Like I've always been so interested and intrigued because out of that comes so many other things, whether, whether it's fabric, colors, that kind of thing. And I've always been really intrigued by that, um, that high-end Hermes, that kind of thing. So Louis Vuitton, you know, I, I just think that there's something there with these brands through history and how they continue. It's like Madonna, right? Like how do you remain relevant in pop culture all the time? Yeah. So is there a particular innovation within fashion or is it just the endless propensity for new designs? I would say what's old is new again. I'm always fascinated by the fact that like, First, it was skinny leg jeans. Now it's not. And I mean, I'm just always fascinated by the what must go through their minds. Like, you know, whiskey, age stated whiskey, finished whiskey, like it all kind of comes back full circle. And that's just an industry in particular that I think has always, and it, and it you know, when I go to the, when I go to can or I go to a trade show, I spend more time looking at luxury brands and how they're doing it and what's new and what's come in because it helps me develop and really think outside the box when it comes to how we design ourselves as well. Mm, yeah. And um, so what's an innovation that you'd love to see in the world, something that really annoys you or something that would give you great joy if it were to be invented? So I would love it if every morning for a female that Instead of like having to apply things like your makeup and stuff like that, you could just hold up your phone and be done. Like, I mean, just the littlest things about shaving time off that I can't stand. Like shaving. Um, taking time to do, <laughs> like shaving. You know what I mean? Like all these things that women have to do that men don't have to even, you know, worry about. It's like, how do I shave that time off and just not have to worry anymore? You know what I mean? Or like, can, you know, save time working out or doing other things that I really enjoy that sometimes, unfortunately, kind of have to get put off because of all the other stuff that we have to do. Yeah. Any, so anything. maybe like those Korean sheep masks, you know, <laughs> you could just like apply a mask like that and you would just pull it off and you'd be perfectly made up. I'm ready for it. All right. Korean cosmetics entrepreneurs listening to us. We're ready. We're ready. We are ready. <laughs> we are ready for you. <laughs> well, Heather, thank you so much for joining me on the Innovation Storyteller Show today. How can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Or, and I'm sure they will beseech you for the next taste of the new release of whatever brilliance you're going to be coming up with. <laughs> well, I would say this, tune in because there is so much exciting stuff on the horizon for the Jack Daniels brand. Um, so really, really excited about that. And everyone can get in touch with me um, through LinkedIn too. Um, so I'm Heather Voorhees How You can follow me. I just shared that our CEO, Lawson Whiting at the New York Stock Exchange um, and celebrating some of our recent acquisitions as well as holding up Bonded with our coveted number one whiskey in the world, Jack Daniels Bonded. So if you can find that, get it. I can assure you on the secondary market, hopefully very soon, you'll be very pleased that you listen to this podcast. <laughs> there you go. 
Heather Hall, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation today. And I think I know what I'm going to be drinking this holiday season. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Season's greetings to you. And it's been a complete honor. Thank you for having me on the show. My pleasure.